Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for another episode of Wax Lyrical here at Jacaranda Records. This month's guest is Yao Osu, uh, who is the curator of Liverpool International Music Festival. He's also um, head of Nothing But The Music and Airbeats. Yao, have I missed anything out there? Yeah, no, no, that's, that's fine, that's fine. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, I w we're here today to talk to you about your love of music, so let's get the ball rolling. Um, how did you first um, gain a love of music? Where did it sort of flourish? I think my um, my introduction to music was just in the house, like um, like many Afro-Caribbean families in places like UK and American stuff, like music is pretty much central to kind of keeping the kind of I suppose the culture together. So we we would have. Uh, I grew up in Magal, which is not the most culturally diverse place, and um, so we used to have a lot of family parties. Um, I'll probably say every month. From, and people used to come from Preston, Birmingham, London, and you know when you're young, you don't get to choose the music. They just play. So I grew up on everything from like my mum's Jamaican, so a lot of reggae, um, and then my dad's African, so it was kind of what what they call high life, which is just traditional African music. So it'd be like Daddy Lumber, and then you'd have Bob Marley, and then you might have, you know, American soul stuff. So we'd have a lot of Motown. We'd have a lot of, you know, early Michael Jackson, Jackson 5 stuff. Um, so I just remember just listening to loads, do you know what I mean? There was stuff like Lionel Richie. I remember hearing quite a bit of Lionel Richie early on in the house. And it was just all that amalgamation. And then it got to a point where, as I started to get to about six, seven, eight, when we used to go to other people's houses for parties. I had a lot of kind of older cousins and, you know, I suppose extended family that used to play me stuff. And that's when I started getting into hip hop quite early on. So I'd say I was about, maybe about seven, far too young to be listening to the stuff I was listening to. But I think I remember Tupac, his, his debut album, I think I remember hearing that when I was seven. So that was like 1990. So, um, and then, you know, Ice Cube, Predator, NWA. There was something that, it was a guy called Normski. He used to have some show on radio, uh, BBC Two. And my cousin used to tape it and play me it. So yeah, you're probably talking around early 90s, if not late 80s. You know, I was watching films like Do The Right Thing and the soundtrack of that. So like Fight The Power by Public Enemy. That must have been about 88, 89. Boys in the Hood, around that period. Men of Society, 93. And I was just soaking up all these, this music. But at the same time, I had the kind of the traditional stuff my parents and family, all the family members were playing. So uh, obviously hip hop, a large part of it is based on samples from original uh, music, soul and funk. Did you find that lots of the music that you were getting into was influenced from that early selection that your parents were See, playing? See, I, I didn't get this, I didn't get the connection at that time. Um, it's even like, what was, what's strange, and you know, it's probably jumping forward, but when I got uh, involved in doing Lymph, it was quite interesting that a lot of the songs that had come from Liverpool bands, I didn't know with Liverpool bands. Like, if I'm honest, they were just big records, do you know what I mean? So, you know, you know, Space, the Female of the Species, and all that. I, I, I remember the chart show on Saturdays, and you know, all that stuff would be on, and I didn't, I had no understanding that that was Liverpool. So I was like that with, you know, hip hop records, I didn't know they were sampling from jazz and jazz, sampling from soul. Um, it's, it's interesting that as I got to about 21, 22, before I even started doing what I'm doing now, um, you know, Kanye West, Jay Diller, Premier, all that kind of stuff, I'd start getting the connection then and going, I swear I've heard that. And, you know, it was interesting tune. It was, I was into Garage as well when I was like 17. So, but like Garage, Garage, London Garage kind of stuff. And I remember this tune, it was, um, but they sampled Master Blaster by um, Stevie, Wonder. Stevie Wonder, which is weird, because I was like, I know this record. I know this, this is not original record. And it's, it's that thing that I've started to learn as I grow older is to kind of unpick where those things come from. Mm. Find, I, I find it fascinating, it's more social. It's more of a social commentary. But you can imagine, you know, the Kanye West there and his mum is playing those records in the house. So when he's producing, he hears something that he likes, but he probably can't put his finger on it. He puts it in the record and then all of a sudden it's a, right on the pulse culture-wise for that time, but it's because a lot of us have got a lot of those reference points in our, in our past as well, so. Most definitely, yeah. It's, it's great to hear the intellect behind what someone does with a piece of music as well, how they reinterpret it and bring it back to being something new and fresh. I think that's amazing, do you know what I mean? And I think it's, you know, once again, jumping forward, it's something that I've tried to 
do with lymph in terms of the program is kind of look at how you can tackle you know, music, music programming, but you can kind of be quite smart about where you're pulling the influences from and the themes and, and just make it feel fresh and new. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So I think it's been, you know, it's it's been a... Um, it is looking at those things, and it's, it's all there, you know, sometimes to explain it. You know, the, what's the saying? You've you got to live life forwards, but you, you can only explain it backwards. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's like that. So when I do think about some of the early kind of consumption of music and some of the stuff forced on me, it's quite interesting that I'm in a place now where, you know, I find it quite easy to be open to any form of music. And I find it quite easy, to, I believe, to, to just listen and, and find good music. Do you mm. know what I mean now? So. Uh, so, could we speak about those particular artists then that you you sort of were influenced from? Is there any particular names that stand out? Well, there's one. You know, this is always. I, I always think if, if I look at the beginning of Love and Music, um, but my kind of stuff. I think the first record is a tune called "I Need Love" by L Cool J, and the reason why this is so random. It's not a song I like. It's quite like cheese, just to be honest. But I remember being. I remember staying with my cousins, uh, my older cousins, and he had like this Fisher Price tape player. I remember it so vivid. And I reckon I was five. So I reckon this was 88. So maybe someone could double check when that record come out. And um, he had a tape and he played this song on and I remember hearing it and it just, it, my, my life actually changed. Do you know what I mean? Because I'd never heard rap or anything like that before. And I feel like it was kind of around Michael Jackson bad. I was a big Michael Jackson fan, like extremely. And the fact that he comes to Aintree, which was like three miles away from my home and I couldn't go in 88. Destroyed, destroyed my soul. But I remember hearing this, I Need Love by Elko Jane, just thinking, wow, this is, this is amazing. And then that led me to kind of, not only stalking my cousin who had music, access to music like this, but literally becoming fanatical about hip hop music. So I'll probably play that first and then move from there. I, do, I just remember that changing it and then me just going nuts and I, I think, that was the beginning of my kind of understanding. That it was something different with hip hop, not only because it was kind of youth music, but in terms of I felt it did form quite a lot, large part of my identity when I was young, because really you got your parents' culture and then you try to create your own. And you know, it's always that juxtaposition of being British, but being kind of black British means that you don't 100% feel like the culture here is yours. So the closest thing that you, because even with your parents, you don't feel, oh, what? I've got no connection to Africa. I've got real, no real connection to Jamaica. So American hip hop was quite interesting because it was kind of, it was youthful. It had a certain bravado to it that was quite interesting. And it was kind of larger than life, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And obviously now when I know about what happened in the States and why it was kind of cutting through at that period, um, it's quite interesting, do you know what I mean? But at the time I just, I kind of just loved it. I just thought out oh, of that small little Fisher Price thing, it's kind of like, I feel like looking backwards once again, the whole thing just rolled out in front of me. I was kind of like, yeah, I want to do something like around that. Not in an employment thing, but just, you know, like I want to be around it. I want to consume it. I want to understand it. And, you know, I've done the whole thing. It was like before Tim Westwood on Radio 1, there was Mark Tonderai. And I remember listening to it and recording every song. And for the week, I'd, I'd be listening to just that. And it's, it's, it, it started with that record, though. Okay, so you touched on your uh, your folks' music collection. Do they still have this collection, or? Yeah, they do. You know, they had. Um, I've I've started to take away some stuff from the house, but in the same place in the front room, there's still the stack system. That's like, I don't know. You probably sell it for a lot of money now. So I had your vinyl thing at the top and your tape player and your yeah your amp and all that kind of thing. And we had massive speakers. So I just remember our our parties. I always feel everyone says this, but I always feel our party was the best. We had a good decent system um, and the records are still there um, every now and again I did see the Lionel Richie one in my mum's um, conservatory I know a lot of stuff's in the loft um, but yeah it was it was everything and then when I started compiling my own I used to buy at one point when I was 11 I used to from 11 till I was about 18 I used to buy a, a single a single album every weekend um, so I, I you know I was, I was hitting the thousands before I moved out of home in terms of yeah, the record. So it was um, about tapes. It was tapes, and then it was CDs. Yeah. So um, so obviously we've spoken about what kind of uh, got you into music. Can you remember what your first purchase was? Yeah, I think my first. This could be a lie, but I think my first purchase was Dr. Dre, the Chronic, and I reckon it was. I, I believe it was 1991. I think he always fooled people on what year. Or it was 1990. So I, once again, I was seven, eight. 
Max, it was terrible that I used to listen to stuff like this. But you know, when everyone says hip hop's a bad influence, I feel like I speak well and I conduct myself mm. well and on time. So I don't actually believe it because I was into some of the most heinous, misogynistic music. If that's how you look at it, some of the content was, you know, but I actually found some kind of, I felt it was artistic. I thought the chronic, and what Dr. Dre was doing with albums was kind of like, people give Kendrick Lamar loads of respect now and talk about how he puts these albums together with the skits and all this, and it, it makes it flows and it's this thing. And I was like, I, I see Dr. Dre's fingerprints all over that because mm -hmm. Dr. Dre was doing that back then. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not saying it's anything new. You know, I know a lot of people done it before, but in terms of that hip, hip hop being quite artistic, but still having all the kind of emotion and the anger and the rage that it's known for, I think Dr. Dre done it su supremely. So. This track I'm gonna play is uh, called Fuck With Dre Day, um, and it's Dr. Dre, but obviously, once again, like the whole crew is bringing Snoop Dogg and them through, so I thought this was a, quite a momentous record. So like, obviously, I was eight years old, listening to that stuff. I remember going to school, and it was a kid in my class. I tried to remember when I was thinking about this yesterday, a guy called Sam Kelly, and he was like, we were, I'd say, year four? Second year juniors, year four, yeah, year four. And I remember saying, he was saying, no, you're saying to me, have you heard such and such person? I was like, yeah, yeah, he goes, he's so racist. And it's like, we knew this word racist, yeah. So I was like, why is it, they say the M word? And, it's, and I was like, the black, you know? And it was quite interesting that I, from the beginning, I kind of got a lot of those things. I don't know how or where, how it was taught to me, but it's even, you know, I kind of knew all the, a lot of the backstories to songs like this. So that was obviously when NWA broken up. You know, Easy and Dr. Dre and Ice Cube, they're all in this massive feud. Now, obviously, in Straight Out Compton, now it's kind of popularized and stuff like that, but at the time, but I just loved it. I loved the, the production and the samples, and they used to call that thing, and um, what they were doing was G Funk, and which was taken from obviously George Clinton, P Funk, and, and it was just quite interesting. It was almost like through listening to them, it kind of took, took, you, took you back. And I remember, um, what year was it? 2000. And, Last year, uni, 2004, I'd done African-American studies as an extra module. I was doing law, but I, I, I don't know why. I took this other module, and I was bored. So it was one of the big things that we, we looked at was soul and, and how soul music and some of the content that was coming out, like Sam Cooke and Marvin Gaye and what they were talking about, how it, fixed, it connected to the times in terms of what was happening socially and how music... And I always felt hip-hop was that thing, you know what I mean? For like a later generation, it was almost like it just totally reflected what what was going on, do you know what I mean? I think music, the best music's always been that way, that these great artists have been able, and bands have been able to soak up what's going on. And it's like, you know, why has Liverpool had, you know, an output that is unbelievably, you know, arguably the leader in the world in terms of a, such a small place in music. And people say it's because, you know, obviously the amalgamation of people come from all different places, but also the fact that Liverpool's never had anything given to them. It's always been a tough, tough place. So if you're gonna do something, you end up being the best at it. Um, and I think you can see the same thing with you know what was coming out of New York and you know LA with with hip hop and you know it, it, I just think it's dead interesting you know you know as we go through. So obviously uh, you've, you Dre was a big influence um, the sort of old school gangster rap G G funk things like that. Uh, is there any other sort of influences that you'd like to mention? Um, you know, if I look at people who like, obviously there's loads of people influence me, but from my, my side of things, you know, it's a, I kind of deal with the more the business side and, and I've always looked at music and, you know, even when we started like Airbeats, it's been like, it's, I haven't just done music to, to do music. I, I don't really, um, I'm, I don't have aspirations of being a musician or a producer or anything like that. I've always seen the kind of the bigger, the bigger meaning and purpose behind music. So we started Airbeats, which is our first company in 2014. For 2004, 2005, and that was my cousin at the time just doing music. And I liked the whole idea of, okay, well, you're doing these two shows in Ormskirk, um, but, you know, let's sell T-shirts, let's do the CDs and that. And this is not even me, I'm not done business, so it's not a situation. I just always felt there was this wider economy, I suppose, around music. And this, you know, as creative as he is with, the, in, with making the music, I always thought I could be as creative you know, behind the scenes and, 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 and doing stuff. So I always had the idea of that. And then, you know, when we started it, I realized how soon people gravitated to us. There's a lot of people who were doing original 
urban music at that time. It wasn't even urban. It was it was hip hop, rap, and hip hop. I'm trying to think of HMV classifications. It was rap, hip hop, soul. <laughs> so urban didn't exist until like Justin Timberlake times. Do you know what I mean? It didn't. It wasn't actually like a thing. So. But I just remember people gravitating us from all parts of Liverpool, well, Merseyside, really, and um, joining our collective, which was Air Beats. And, you know, I realised it was it was more than what... It was more than just making music. And then the impact it had, we started doing a lot of stuff in schools and, you know, a lot of, like, hard-to-reach city safe and all these were getting us involved with youth service going, you know, all our kids listen to hip-hop and rap music and they listen to Kofi and they listen to Blizz and they listen to Pyro and the younger mob. Do you reckon you can come speak to them? So we realised, well, this is well bigger than just putting records on on a CD and selling them, do you know what I mean? And, you know, as I say, like, we've, our company's been running 11 years now. I've had splinter companies that have existed and stuff. So I know that, once again, that initial belief that it could be bigger than this and you could sell multiple things, but you could also deliver a, a certain level of quality, um, a certain level of, um, inspiration through through the music has always been there and I, and I got that from hip-hop like I remember I put it on Twitter one time remind me never to do this on Twitter but I put them and said yeah hip-hop changed my life and so oh, what do you mean you, you haven't did it and I was like because the basis of my business the basis of how I work and the basis of how I conduct myself really is predominantly based on hip-hop do you know what I mean it's that mm. and sports from being in sports teams and hip hop, the two things I've kind of taken what I've learned from both those things and applied it to being in business. You know, I've never called myself an entrepreneur or anything like that. I just think it's the combination of those those things that have kind of made me do what I do. Can you imagine what you would be doing if you weren't involved in music? Is there any any sort of family business or is No, is I'm trying to build one. Darren? Yeah, I'm trying to build <laughs> one now. So we do have a family business. Um what would I do? I, I, was, I was really into playing basketball from when I was 11 till I was 21. Basketball was actually my life. You know, the music thing, I just listened to music and consumed it um, and I fell into it at the, after I finished uni and stopped playing basketball. But basketball was my thing. So I don't know if I would have gone into coaching if I didn't. So what happened was I got really good at basketball around 16 years old. Um, about 14 years old, I started playing for Sox of Tigers. We were one of the better teams in the country. So it was a guy called Henry Mooney who was like, the um, the coach there and it was kind of you had sports teams but they were quite organised it was it was mad we'd have a game every week we were playing national league so we were travelling around the country a lot of the kids were from Toxteth and I was I was I was was literally the only person who was not from even close to that area so I used to travel from a goal two times a week and we we won the national league so we were the best team in the country and uh, I don't know I was sixteen yeah sixteen seventeen and I I, I like I just wanted to go over to America, playing the NBA, all that stuff. I was fascinated by Michael Jordan. If, if, and it impelled in comparison to my fascination with this this man and what he was about. Um, and then, yeah, so I love, I love, and I reckon, I love sport, basketball, but I reckon I would have probably liked to go into something like that. But what happened was I, I got hurt. I was playing, strangely enough, for the US military team down south. They got two bases, Milton Hall and Lake Heath, And I was playing for the military team there, the Air Force team. And I got hurt in the April, and my final exams in the June, July, finish uni, come back, and it, then my cousin moved up here from London and was like, I've got two or three gigs this summer, will you help organize? And I didn't know what the hell I was doing that, gonna, gonna do. Um, and applied for some jobs like at Virgin and places like that, Zavi and all those things. And um, I just didn't know what I was gonna do, and then I fell into it. Do you know, it literally, I fell into that. Done those two gigs that summer, my idea was I'd be done. Then I done something else, and then I was like, "Oh, I might set up a business." And then I done that, and every time I say I'm going to be done, I just end up rolling into something new. So I don't know what I would have ended up doing. I'd like to do something around the basketball, but I don't know. I come out of I had a law degree. I had all these little bits and bobs, tr basketball training, referee training, all these youth work qualification. I've had, but I, I I don't know. Something felt really good about me being involved in music and being in the studio and being around creatives, real creatives. So just back onto music, uh, we've mentioned Liverpool International Music Festival. Uh, I was gonna ask you if there's any particular artists that you've worked with over the time that you've been working on this festival, who stand out, who, who you have? Do, do you know, I think because I suppose it's a bit weird because I've gone into this and so like, obviously Air Beach was set up, I'll, 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 I'll wind it back and maybe that hopefully answer your question. So Air Beats was set up in 20, 2004, 2005. Ram still is still running, but literally it was a music business. It was 
it was you know about the creators putting stuff out but we've done loads of branch off stuff we had a magazine we had a radio uh, a online radio show before i I didn't even know what they were, but one of the young guys around was like, you could do this thing. We had a store, we used to sell clothes. We had, we used to deliver workshops. We had a graphic design wing. We had, it was massive. It got that big around 2007, 2008. I split off another company called 100 Global, which is totally commercial. It was management consultancy. So we started doing campaigns for labels, but we also put out music commercially under that company. And then around 2009, yeah, the UK grime artist Wiley, in his way that he does, moved up to Manchester and then moved to Liverpool and I ran his label, A-list, under 100 Global for like 18 months, which was quite interesting because he was like an idol to me in terms of UK music. And then I, st uh, I had a magazine called Mesh Culture at the time and around 2011, a guy used to run One Extra, who's one of the execs who started One Extra, he, he left BBC. We joined forces, I closed 100 Global down, we combined it into the Playmaker Group. Hence, this is why I have numerous companies that delivers kind of representation, you know, media content creation, you know, stage management, production and all that, like multi, multi, you know, facets of the organization. But under that company, he was already representing a lot of Radio One and One Extra DJs, like DJ Target, Dev, but also the Marley, so Damian Marley, Stephen Marley. Um, so this was all before Lymph. So Lymph kicks in about 2013. Um, so quite late, it's quite a you know recent acquisition or activity for me. So going back to the artist that thing, I, I don't think any in any artist in Lymph has been anything bigger than. This sounds really weird, but in terms of my working with than the artists that I've worked outside the Lymph. So my number one would be. Um, I suppose, it's a cross, I suppose. Wiley was great being around. I don't think, you know, of all the wacky stories people talk about Wiley, Wiley's a genius. I've seen him do seven songs in one day. Like, that's like, you know, I'm talking about going to his house and watching the guy walk in the room and, like, midnight that night, he's done seven songs. Beats, recorded, written. Could put them out and people would be happy with it. Do you know what I mean? A beast, do you know what I mean? And a, but, you know, people talk about how mad he is and all this stuff, which is... is that level of genius is like, we've seen it through history, do you know what I mean? It's like that trade-off, it, 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 it's amazing. It's, so like, he's been one of my, he's a big inspiration to me because the thing with him is he knew himself and at the time I didn't understand that because he, he was like on Twitter doing it, he was like a menace on Twitter at the time and he used to kind of do stuff and I got my appointment to run his label on Twitter. He was like, and the next person who's gonna think, and I was following it just like everyone else, who the hell is he gonna say? And he's like, and I just realized he's one of them people, he'd see something in someone and he'll put you in that position and he'll be like, you, it's what you do with it now, do you know what I mean? He was, people thought he was crazy when he appointed two 17-year-olds as his manager, when he was like at the height of his, you know, he started number two record, he just had a top two. People thought he was nuts, do you know what I mean? But it, 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 it was genius, so he's definitely one of them. And then through the PMG, um, the Playmaker group, Damian Marley is like, I was talking to someone about it, I think on Friday, and I was like, this guy, you know, like, He's got so much presence, you know. For someone who didn't know his dad, you know, he's a little kid. I think he was probably like two or three when his dad died. I don't think any of the Marleys embody what the dad did, like him and Bob Marley's definitely one of my my inspirations, but someone I didn't really connect with until only about three or four years ago. But mainly through the fact that we were working with the Marleys. And, you know, where my world interjects is I, I brought Damien Marley to Lim first year, 2013. Lim first year wasn't um it wasn't it wasn't easy. I think a lot of people kind of looked at it from a distance. It probably looked quite easy. I've come in. I've come in quite late. So I've come in in March. I was away for pretty much the whole of March. I only really started doing something in April. The festival went on for five weeks, pretty much something programmed all the time. And then obviously Sefton Park was a big gamble. You got four days in the park. What are you going to do with it? We've also put like these pop paid for events on the waterfront. We had summer camp over at Camp and Fairness. You know, I had to program this park with very little resource, and we, you know what I mean? And it was like the mayor's will to get the, make the park work, do you know what I mean? So there's a bit of pressure. But I felt like that Damien Marley on a Sunday night was quite big for me because it was like, never with a Marley or as a Marley step foot in this city. Um, obviously there's, there's the stories of Damien's granddad, who once again he's never met, was from Liverpool. But he, you know, he didn't know, you know, it was, it was this thing, it was mad, you know, 
he just played Rotterdam in Europe the day before. He was playing the Red Bull stage the next day, and he's come to Liverpool and done a free show for, for the people. And um, I remember him coming off stage and being mad, and I was like, oh, what's gone wrong, what's gone wrong? And he's, he was mad because he was like, I should have brought the band, I should have done it properly for you, you know what I mean? But I felt that moment of what it represented, and what it said about Liv, what it communicated to Liv. I remember reading the Independence or the Guardian the next day, and they were like, Liverpool outshone any other city that weekend, or Liverpool outshone um, not Kill Carnival or whatever. It was that thing like on that day, and you know, I felt when you're saying like the, the best artists, I feel like some of the some of the some of the best artists, the most interesting artists I work with, are outside of lymph because I work in a lot more close quarters with them. But I feel like I've been able to cross some stuff up and make make some stuff happen as part of lymph. That's been quite interesting. Would you like to play any music by these artists that yeah. you've just been speaking about? I'll play um, Damien Marley. It was a tune called Affairs, Affairs of the Heart, and it was an EP that he put out. Um, it was part of an EP that he put out, and this is the first project I work for Damien. Um, it was quite good. Playlist on one extra, you know, spot plays Radio 1, da, 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 da. And it's quite interesting, but um, not a typical Damien Marley record, but a record that I really, I really liked. So, with regard to uh, this year's bookings, obviously yeah. you've got massive names like Giles Peterson, one of my personal favourites. Oh, good, good. Miss Dynamite. Uh, you've also got uh, local Lipper legend Natalie McCool. Yeah, who's yeah. doing great things at the moment. Um, how is this year's lymph shaping up for you? I always felt the uh, year four of lymph would be difficult because um, obviously year one you got the surprise factor. Year two, it's kind of building on that stuff. So year two, we had, you know, we done the event with MTV. The park, obviously, once again, strengthened up again. That offer at Summer Jam, we had, um, we done the event with BET. It was, you know, it, it's kind of building. That was 18 days. Then last year, we really condensed it, and we had, obviously had Basement Jackson all that. And it was, I believe, in terms of the numbers, media reach, everything, it was almost a successful year. But I knew year four would be, a, a, I suppose, a difficult one because then the it's that thing where it's it's a successful entity. So, you know, it's been, for me, it's been an interesting kind of situation to kind of program Lymph this year because we've had a lot of goodwill and a lot of people want to be interested um, and involved, should I say. But we've also got a lot of other factors playing a part in the program. Well, not the programming, but where it sits and, 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 and what we do, I suppose. But this year, um, yeah, I'm very happy with it, to be fair. It's, it's, we've done our first announcement at the end of January. We've got another announcement on April 21st, which I think which is a lot more about the difference of lymph. So, you know, you know, we have Lymph Summer Jam, which is the free outdoor element, which is, you know, classed as the biggest free music event in the whole of Europe. Then we've got the commissions or stroke lymph presents, as we're calling them now, which is all about the kind of themed, more artistic activities. So Giles Peters is involved. And this year's theme is redefinition for, you know, going doing a lot of the work that we done last year. Um, which and the theme last year was about music migration and kind of the roots of music and stuff. This year, I thought it was important that you know Liverpool's got this ability to redefine itself. You know, kind of every decade, it almost kind of goes, oh yeah, that's what we were then, but this is what we are now musically. This is this is what it's about. So you know, you could be talking. You know, obviously you had the kind of amazing beat scene, and then you know it's almost like the decade after kind of just rebelled against that and made their own scene, and then you know again and again and again. So this year is all about redefinition. So we, you know, bringing someone like in J like Giles Peterson, a well-respected soul jazz, you know, who, who know who loves the organic, you know, the original stuff, but also loves the kind of activity that's going on now to program a project called From the Soul, which is going to look at like three decades of soul music and how it's developed British soul music. And then, you know, we've got this project called 76 to 16, um, Eric's, from Eric's to Evo, which is all about kind of Liverpool's counterculture scene, but going from, you know, you know institution like Eric's to, to like Evo. It would have been the Casimir, but Eric's to Evo works really well, I suppose. But like, um, looking at kind of like Liverpool's always had, had this counterculture, musical movements and, and culture and everything that surrounds it. So, you know, it's it's these things that I think I believe sets Lymph apart. You know, the park stuff's great, you know what I mean? It's like you got four or five areas of music, you got sixty thousand people a day. And I think it's important. I think it's 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 a massive statement by the city to go with everything that's going on, we believe that music should not be exclusive, it should be free. But I feel like the the elements that really make 
lymph at inherently different festival is the lymph presents activity and the academy which is you know obviously the academy is a big big part of you know what i'm about in terms of developing new talent and bringing new talent through but um yeah, it's, it's been an interesting year, but I do think, you know, I suppose I've got to say it every year, but I do mean it. I feel like Lymph every year takes a massive stride. And, you know, my whole thing was to get to year three and then see how it develops uh, and where we go. But hopefully, you know, I'm here in year five, and I think year five will be for that first stage of Lymph and kind of putting Lymph in a position. I, I believe that would be when I would have done my job, completed my job, so to speak. I think it's fantastic that you've been able to keep it free. Uh, and also take it in new avenues. Uh, how have you felt in terms of the music industry? Because obviously festivals are big business now. Yeah. They're very corporate. Uh, have you seen that change over the years that you've been yeah, working? Yeah, I have. that's what I'm saying. Even like, you know, the expectations internally from the commercial team at the Liverpool City Council in terms of lymph and what it brings in and all that stuff. You know, those things change. And it, it, it is that, they, like, it's harder to go out there and book talent because the live festival circuit is now, it's brutal, do you know what I mean? You know, you're in Liverpool where there's like 25 music festivals, so at some point we're all going to be trying to book similar artists at some point and someone's going to be upset, you know, just add another festival added to Liverpool Fusion Festival, which is great, once again, I've always said it's great for the city and it's great for the punters, but, you know, obviously, once again, Liverpool International Music Festival is operated by the City Council, so we've always got to be quite mindful of that. So it's... It, it, it's an interesting one, do you know what I mean? Once again, I'm, I, I work on, I feel like I work on pretty much every side of the thing. So I'm a me, I, I receive products and I have like a blog called um, Beat Club. So we, we put on artists, we cover artists that we like. You know, I still create radio shows and documentaries. I manage artists, I put out music and I book a festival, do you know what I mean? So, and, and program other events. And so, so I think with my holistic view of the industry, it's it's a mad time because it's like the platforms are shrinking, which means it's more volatile to get the stuff you need to make it work. Um, I think so. You know what what I do and what I'm trying to set my company up to do to be more of a curator of stuff to make it really make sense and punch through is key. But it's like yeah, it's tough. You know what I mean? It's it's a, it's a it's a tough time. But I, you know, still the greatest artists and all that will always rise to the top. The problem you've got is if it ends up becoming a situation whereby certain artists and certain agents and, and people like in position of power are getting more and more and more and it becomes a monopoly at the top level because it becomes a monopoly and you've only got, well, you've got three labels, three major labels really now anyway. But if it becomes with agencies, they all start combining and, you know, you're going to get, and, and the festivals needs this big talent to survive, you're going to get a situation whereby you're pricing all the smaller festivals. And that's why, me personally, I think Lymph's strongest point is to not get into that point, to just be Liverpool, to have Liverpool's character and to almost be inherently different, which is the phrase I like to use. It's about doing those quirky, interesting stuff. It may not be the biggest names, but let the guys up there do it because half of them aren't... Half of them are making losses, you know what I mean? It's, it's well reported that half of those festivals are making huge losses. And I'm like, well if we can focus on program and interest and quirky stuff that captures people's imagination and makes people travel to Liverpool to see it and obviously people in Liverpool enjoying it I think that's that's the key you know way to sustain lymph and grow lymph and make sure it's here in 20 years that's my big thing I've got two year, two and a half year old son and I'm like every decisions I make now has got to be that he, he can enjoy lymph when he's 20 plus it shouldn't be a situation where it's a short game it should be a long-term game because I think music's critical to this city anyway and Lymph plays a part in that. I think investing in uh, cutting-edge artists as well, you know, people who are just sort of um, getting hyped will obviously pay dividends in the future because these artists are the next wave. Oh, totally, yeah. If you're booking them for Lymph, you know, well, I, why we, wouldn't they come back and play When we you? started the Lymph Academy, it wasn't... Part of my brief when I started Lymph Academy didn't say you've got to have a... Um, a when I started Lymph, they didn't say you had to have an academy, or, or, they, but they said they wanted like intergenerational stuff going on. And I had the idea of, okay, we'll start an academy where we, we spot talent who are young, who need a bit of nurturing and support, and we develop them and showcase them. Because um, my thing was this, for the long, longest time, the city of Liverpool has had artists who have done well here but don't feel a major affinity to the city because the city, apart from the, the clubs and bars and all that, the city hasn't really played a big role in their development. It's this, in spite of the city, they've succeeded. So what I've said is, as far as I'm concerned, if I'm leading Lymph and that, that can't be the case. It's got to be the other way around. 
So it's got. I don't want any artist to come and be a massive artist out of Liverpool or band, should I say, band or artist or DJ producer type, and not feel like Lymph has had some role in either showcasing them, developing them, or investing in them in some manner. Do you know what I mean? I'd like I actually flat out refuse. Do you know what I mean? To be in that because I feel like that's what the city's there for. We are creative, very much known as international music city. So we've got to be in that, and you know. I think Limp's made massive strides there because I feel like a lot of the bands who are coming through, you know, we have managed to showcase them. And then there's there's a whole raft of artists that are, are coming through now. We're getting signed and stuff that have been showcased. Like Mike Lowry, for instance, one we showcased the part of the Academy year one. Year two, we put them on our BET showcase, which went out to 90 million homes around the world. Year three, we put them on main stage. You know, they, they've, been signed, they've been signed to Universal Records, not because of anything we've done, but I believe we've been part of that way of kind of going, well, you know, when you write your biog, you know, we're, we're, we're a respected entity. You know, they can put us in there and it, it makes it quite clear. You know, and once again, it's the city's backing because Lymph represents the city's mm-hmm. music office. So I think that's quite critical, do you know what I mean? And, you know, long live the Academy. So speaking of these new artists, is there anyone you'd like to play as in particular? Yeah, I, I'm going to play, this is going to see, I, I, from the Academy second year, there's a kid called Sam Volo, who come to Liverpool from London to um, to study at the university, which is the case of a lot of creatives that end up in the city. Um, but he's, he come through the Academy in 2014, 2015, and then I've ended up managing him. I mentored him through that year. I ended up managing him. I think he's an absolutely great talent. Um, so I thought I'd play one of his records. It's a, it's a, it's a project that... Steve Levine, another person who, who's come from London to Liverpool and has kind of done loads of activity and work here and he really cares about the scene. They ended up working together on, on an EP for Sam and things have just gone obviously from strength to strength for, for Sam. Um, so I'd like to just play one of his, his records. It's called Rescue Me. Yeah, he's got a great voice, very similar to uh, Jamie Liddell. Oh, right, he good, good call, good yeah. call. But uh, like, I think he's, he, he's just been, like he's a producer, songwriter, and as I say, I've been working with him since sep- September last year. And I just, I, I don't think personally, and this is going to, like, in terms of raw talent, I don't think I've been around as good at, uh, of a talent before. And, you know, I've had the luxury, and especially in that world, I've had luxury of working with some good artists and not artists that I just represent, but people I've done music campaigns for and stuff that I just think he's, he's, he's really special. Do you know what I mean? It's going to be interesting how, how he develops. And, you know, it's a pr- it's, once again, I think it shows what this city's about. You've got people who can kind of come here, make it their home, straight away get almost inducted into the music scene, get linked with the right types of people, and then it can launch their career. And I think, you know, it's it's... It's something special about the city when people ask about why is the city it's just I think it's all welcome and then you can come here and it's your home and then you, you develop and if you need to move on past that you still feel that link with Liverpool Liverpool's still as part of your heart I think Sam's just a, a perfect example of that his voice is there already you can tell he's confident in his in his delivery it's it's spot it's there, on it's yeah. an artist straight away um, is there anyone else you'd like to sort of give a heads up to? Do you know what? It's like, like I'm going to do all my all the ones I'm putting out this year. So I've got obviously Sam. I've got um, artist called Spicazzi. Um There's no artist called Suede Brown who's like the Katrin Arda type style. So he's a producer who's, I think it's it's that next generation who who can't be just one thing. So they grew up listening to hip hop, but they grew up listening to pop, but there's also grew up listening to dance. Especially think about Liverpool, you know, like if if someone grows up, if someone's like fifteen now in Liverpool, you could not with the internet the way it is anyway, you could not be one thing. You could not grow up and be like, I play rock and just play rock because you must have some other things that have come to you, do you know what I mean? And I think some of these kind of producer DJ types and, and as I say, this kid called Sway Brown, I think he's potentially could be that artist that amalgamates dance, the urban stuff, the kind of electronic stuff, all that stuff that's happening in Liverpool now and almost kind of push it through, hopefully. Then you've got a, a young kid called Michael Seary from KB who's doing like drum and bass infused soul popular stuff which I think is interesting kind of like the Sigma stuff but I think once he finds his unique voice within that as a producer I think he's going to fly um, yes because you're putting his arm there's a kid called Sub Blue who's kind of doing the kind of alternative electronic soul pop stuff that you know I don't think 
there's a lot of artists in in England that do it all right, but I don't think anyone does it as well as some of the some of the people in the states. And then American wise, probably American, Anderson Park, people like that. Um, I'm trying to think. There's loads. There's, you know what? There's loads. There's absolutely loads. It's it's mad to. But like I've just got to, the ones that I'm interested in. They're the ones that I only really care about. I have this weird when people ask me about other artists. I'm like. I don't really care. I'm putting out my ones, but yeah, it's a. Uh, but there's loads of good music. It's, it's it, it. The hardest part now with music is, how do you sift through it? Yeah. How do you sift through? It's nuts because I remember, you know, I found more as we've had more ac- access to it. I consume less because before, when I had to root for it and I knew what I was looking for and I was really thing, I used to be able to kind of get loads of it. But you know, when it comes to a point like. I don't want to download everything, but I can download everything, which is really weird, you know what I mean? I think, um, but I tend to, once again, what I was saying before, I tend to go to those curated platforms where I feel like people behind it actually, you know, do care. So like what Beats One and them are doing, like with, you know, Pharrell having his show and Q-Tip having his show and, you know, stuff like Dr. Dre having his radio show, stuff like that interests me more. And then you've got like the really good platforms like Noisy and Pigeons and Playing and, you know, a couple of them online platforms that I think are quite good and quirky. You select stuff and edit. They've got an editorial line, so you feel like it's not just the not Taste throwing makers. stuff on, yeah. And it's not as hardcore as Pitchfork. Mm. And like a bit more open. I think a lot of those platforms, I think, are absolutely key and discover mu- new music. And then, yeah, I'm, I, yeah, it's just, it's, yeah, I'm just, yeah, it's, 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 because it's mad. It's just so much, but it's, mm. it's great, but it's. It's information overload, isn't it? It is. It's a whiteout. It's really hard to sort of sift through, as you say. Uh, that was actually the next point I was going to ask was how, how and where you get your music. So I'll move on to the next one, which is um, what do you see for yourself in the future? Where would you like to take your career from here? Um, I suppose I'm about that, that second decade, and I'll start with my second decade. So I think I'm, I'm putting in place a lot of the activity. I think of all the things I've done, nothing but the music now is kind of my main thing so through nothing but the music i am a consultant with the city council so i do live through nothing but the music um i, I you know i've done work with bbc radio one academy mobo you know all these the grand national program that about two years the stage for the main stage for it you know all these all these activities so i feel like what i'm looking to do with that company is have a one side that's more the program curation side and I have another side which is artist services so i'm trying to I'm in the process of trying to work out a, a way to work with artists, but work with them in a more holistic and natural way. So rather than before, it'd be like, you're coming to me, I manage you, and this is what I do. And, you know, we go forward. It's, you know, it's probably going to be a little bit of, OK, well, I'll take your music to radio, I'll put a bit of money in, but, you know, maybe you fall on the publishing side of the company, and then this guy, I'm just going to help build your profile. So we're going to do some, you know, some visual, I'm going to, put together a visual team who are going to take what you've got here and make it visual and make that really connect. You know, this person, it's about consultancy, this label, it's about da 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 you know, and I want to get more into, into that and being a bit more fluid in the way I work because I think some of the old ways of working with artists and talent, I just don't think work anymore, do you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's a, when, it, when everything's in flux like this, it's, it's loads of opportunities, it's really interesting. I feel like I'm trying to make sure nothing but the music really has clarity in what it does, do you know what I mean, in terms of around that time. So kind of like, you know, obviously I shouldn't really do this, but, you know, your business and the beatbox and, like, the, or the stuff you do, it's kind of like, well, we can program stuff, we can come with quick and creative ideas, we can execute those ideas, but also we, we run an agency, so if you want talent, da 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 da, da. So it's that, it's that kind of thing that I want nothing but the music to be known for. The, the Playmaker Group will continue to do kind of a lot of international work. You know, we still do, you know, a lot of media productions, documentaries, visual documentaries. We do in-flight and British Airways. Uh, Emirates, Kenya Airways, we do radio shows for a lot of stations abroad, a lot of stations in Africa, which I think obviously is a massive, massive, um, you know, demographic to be able to kind of produce stuff for, uh, for and growing. Um, obviously, we look after talent, represent talent. We do about five, five or six festivals, production on festivals, including uh, Damian Marley's reggae tour, which goes from like from Miami across the Caribbean and back, and it has all reggae artists. Like these are things that you know we relish trying to get involved in, and then yeah, it's 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 them ones, and we'll see. You know, hopefully through nothing but the music, you know, I I, I can still develop stuff like Lymph and kind of get get it to stage. But then I've definitely got aspirations to do 
a lot, a lot more stuff. Do you know what I mean? I actually was with a, a guy called Craig Pennington from Be Lito on Friday afternoon. And, uh, you know, I have this thing where I see what other people are doing. I'm like, oh, I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. So, I've, you know, he thinks really wide. You know, he can do stuff with, like, with metal and he can do stuff with, you know, Maisie Rail. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I just want to make sure that I'm bringing some of my ideas to, like, multiple platforms as well. Do you know what I mean? So... Yeah, just constantly, you know, constantly wanting to do that. I want to do more stuff abroad. You know, last year I'd done a documentary for Lymph, which will hopefully, you know, get seen quite a lot this year because it's finished, but we'll put it into film festivals called Rich Jukebox. And we went round, um, we went to New York, Nashville, Kingston, Jamaica, um, to somewhere else, Detroit. And it was all about music cities. So Liverpool's music city and how over the last 75 years, we've had interactions and connections, influenced them, they've influenced us, and we've got these relationships. Uh, I think it's an amazing, amazing piece, but it made me go, I want to do more there, do you know what I mean? I want to do more. Like, I've had reggae around me in my life for years, and then until I went to Jamaica, I went when I was little, but until I went last year, I was like, I need to do more here, because these people, like, this is like a real, this is like what hip hop must have been like in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, where it's like, it's life, it's not even that thing. When I was in Jamaica, I was like, it is actually life. This is the soundtrack of their life. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's they don't make music. It's it, it, it's their life, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? And I was like, right, I need to do something with these people. I need to do something here. Um, yeah, I've got loads of, loads of ideas, it, you know. But like, if you interviewed me 10 years ago, we would have been 2006. AB2 would have been putting out a couple of records. We would have done a couple of showcases. And I would have never said that I would be doing anything with the city or anything with BBC or anything with, you know what I mean, any of these people that I'm working with. I've never, Damien Marley, I've ne you know, none of that would have existed. So I wouldn't know. I just know that it's going to be in that realm of music and it's going to, it's going to, it's going to, you know, it may go against the tide, but I think we'll be perfectly positioned to where we should be. And hopefully I'm, I'm, the same way I am now, just really passionate about music and artists and creatives and stuff like that, yeah. Well, we'll keep our eyes peeled to see where uh, life takes you, Yao. Oh, thanks very and, much. And uh, also, make sure we get a link to the uh, documentary when that's available. No, definitely, definitely yeah. without a doubt. Thanks for having me.